Good afternoon, welcome everyone, and uh, thank you for slogging your way over here. I, as I look around the room, I think it's safe to say that every last person in this hall is a hardcore political junkie, <laughs> just given what you had to get through to get here. Um, but I'm very excited to welcome all of you. Maybe it's actually a good thing that it rained, because otherwise people would be like spilling out across Washington Avenue tonight. This way we get a more intimate setting. I'm very excited to welcome all of you to the first installment of The Anatomy of an Election, a special four-part series that will continue this fall almost to the eve of the presidential election itself, which of course is just 50 days away. The series is co-sponsored by the CV Star Center for the Study of the American Experience and the Lewis L. Goldstein Program in Public Affairs. As you know, a, an American presidential election is a remarkable and a rather daunting thing, um, even for the hundreds of millions of us who have never had the experience of running for president ourselves. You might almost think of it as a highly public courtship ritual between the candidates and the American people, a bizarrely contrived cutthroat wooing contest with its own set of arcane rules and procedures kind of like a season of the TV show The Bachelor, but with 300 million bachelors and only two bachelorettes. <laughs> the series that begins tonight, this Anatomy of an Election series, aims to cut through all that confusion, well, at least to some degree, by looking at this year's campaign from four different angles, politics, technology, money, and media. Our guests will include some of the most thoughtful and original political minds anywhere, both observers and participants, young cubs and old lions, Republicans and Democrats. And we're fortunate enough to kick things off with the very best of the best, Matt Bai and Richard Ben Kramer. Now, perhaps I'm somewhat biased, but uh, as a historian, I always judge writing um, by thinking okay, is this the stuff that's going to be footnoted by historians, that'll be read and referred to by historians 100 or 200 years from now? And that's something that I think can be said of the work of both of the men that we are about to hear from tonight. You know, it's often said in political journalism that today's big story is lining the bottom of tomorrow's birdcage, but these are two writers who really write for the ages. Matt Bai has spent the last decade writing about politics for the New York Times, where he's now chief political correspondent for the New York Times Magazine. He covered both the 2004 and 2008, and now is covering the 2012 presidential campaigns. You probably read his outstanding cover story in the Times Magazine just a couple of weeks ago, Did Barack Obama Save Ohio? A characteristic Bai piece with its deft mix of vivid scene setting and lucid analysis inside dope and grassroots reporting. He also writes the Political Times column for the Times Politics and Government blog, The Caucus, and his critically acclaimed book, The Argument, Inside the Battle to Remake Democratic Politics, was named a Times Notable Book of the Year. And uh, if it doesn't impress you that a book by a Times reporter was named a Times Notable Book of the Year, um, let me just tell you that even the Times' historic arch rival, the Washington Post, in its review described Matt Bai's book as unsparing, incisive, and altogether engaging, a must read. And Matt Bai is currently working on a book about the failed era of boomer politics, as he calls it. Our second guest, Richard Ben Kramer, is the author of What It Takes, The Way to the White House, which has been widely acclaimed as one of the best books ever written on presidential politics. Kramer learned his stuff as a cub reporter for the Baltimore Sun, and his newspaper career le later carried him to the Middle East as a reporter for the Phil Philadelphia Inquirer, where he won a Pulitzer Prize for international reporting. Subsequently, he became a magazine reporter, a best-selling author, a writer of TV documentaries, and, of course, a resident of Chestertown, Maryland. Very proud to say. In fact, uh, not very long ago, um, a member of the uh, younger generation in American politics, a reporter for the online political magazine Politico, did, he came out to the Eastern Shore and did a sort of an homage to Richard Kramer, and uh, he wrote as follows, what it takes is now widely considered the greatest modern presidential campaign book, but the judgment of Washington's elite 
come late to Maryland's eastern shore, and the book's place in political writing has dawned only very late on its author. Well, I guess that means that Richard is both brilliant and humble, but uh, we love him in Chestertown. Finally, before uh, turning things over to these two distinguished guests of honor, I would like to thank my colleagues in the Department of Political Science, Professor Christine Wade, Professor Melissa Deckman, and Washington College's President Mitchell Reese for their support of this series. I'd like to recognize a guest whom we're always honored to have with us, Senator Birch Bayh. Um, who got a little bit wet getting here, I'm uh, afraid to see. But um, uh, Senator Bai, um, as, you, as you probably know, um, is first of all, no relation to Matt Bai, um, I don't think. But uh, he's also a senior, I'm sorry? He spells his name wrong. You can argue about that later. But uh, uh, Birch Bai is also a senior fellow at the Star Center, um, recipient of an honorary degree from Washington College, and he's generously taught and mentored dozens of our students um, here at the college, of our most outstanding students. Um, and uh, on that note, finally, I'd like to recognize and thank one of those students in particular who's here with us tonight, and he is sitting a few seats down from Center by Jack Borer, a 2006 graduate of Washington College. And Jack, while he was here, majored in political science. He was a student associate at the Star Center. Um, he studied with Senator Bai, and now he's become a very accomplished political journalist in his own right, and played an integral role in planning this series over the next few weeks. And you'll get to hear much more from uh, Jack himself when he'll be part of the media panel that concludes this series on October 23rd. So our guests are going to uh, chat for 20 or 30 minutes. Um, and then they'll open the discussion up uh, to the audience, so I hope you'll join us in welcoming Matt Bai and Richard Ben Kramer. Hi, folks. Thank you for braving the weather. <laughs> nice to see you all out here. Uh, I'm very honored to be up here with Matt, who is doing the Lord's work. That is, he is actually going out and trying to get a sense of who these people are and what they mean to do and why are they doing it in the first place, which seems to me as a citizen uh, the kind of question we want answered in a campaign season. Now. I don't have a lot of good news for you, except that Matt's here, <laughs> uh, because I don't think we're finding out who they are and what do they want to do and why are they doing it in the first place. And uh, since Matt has been on the front lines, I'm going to make myself into uh, an interlocutor and ask him what is going on out there and why am I not seeing what I want to see? <laughs> because I'm hoping that it's what you want to see too. But in a little while we'll open it up and if there's something you want to hear about that has not been said, which is, I, I, I think, inevitable, uh, you ask us and, and we will get Matt to tell you what the truth <laughs> is again. <laughs> Uh, so, Matt, uh, tell me why I feel like I don't know anything about Romney. You got to start watching TV, Richard, because that's what. No, look, look, look let me, I'm, I am going to tell you that. Let me step back for one second. Just let me, first of all, say it's, a, it's an honor to be here. I'm going to answer your question in a roundabout way, and I'm going to embarrass you a little bit. It's, it's an honor for me to be here, uh, and I appreciate you all coming out in the, in the pouring rain, and appreciate the kind introduction from Adam. Let me, let me just tell you something, because, uh, and I want you to understand what I mean when I say it's an honor. Um, but almost 20 years ago now, and this pertains to your question, I'll back, almost 20 years ago now, I, I, I was at the paper then known as the Boston Globe, uh, and um, I was, uh, yeah, I was, I was in my early 20s. Anyway, I broke, I was playing football despite my stature. I, I hadn't quite come to terms with age yet, and I uh, shattered my knee. 
and I had, a, I had a bunch of surgeries on my knee, and I was stuck, if any of you have ever had this kind of surgery, I was stuck on a couch for much of that year, and, and uh, you have to sit in this motion machine with your knee, and so you can't do anything but read books, which is kind of cool. Uh, and a friend of mine at the time, uh, taking pity on me, one of the books I was given was What It Takes. Uh, and it was a deeply moving uh, experience for me to read that book. I read it in about, uh, I don't know, four days, three days. It's about as long as it took you to write it. Right? <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, and, and I'll tell you why it was moving, because it pertains to the, to the question. So I'm glad I get to you know, open that way. Uh, I loved politics. I grew up loving politics. I actually, I love politicians. And, I, and, uh, and I've always been fascinated. And I think there's a great ennobling purpose in, in public service. But I'm first and foremost a writer, and I didn't really believe, like a lot of journalists then and now, that you could tell stories about the human condition through covering politics. That politics is about policy analysis and uh, tactics and all the stuff you see on TV, this battleground state and that battleground state and this cliche and the other cliche, but that you couldn't actually move people with stories. And what it takes, uh, you know, in that book, Richard really showed me something different, what was possible. It, it really had an impact on me. And I've spent the last, so to get back to your question, uh, you know, I've spent the last decade or so, longer, but really at the magazine the last decade, trying to practice uh, explanatory journalism in the realm of politics, trying to help people understand how we got to the moment. I don't, I don't want to project what's going to happen because I don't care. We're all going to find out at the same time. Uh, I, I don't care about who's I don't have orthodoxies about who's right and who's wrong because we always turn out to be wrong about things like that. I, I only want to help people understand how we got to where we are and, and what the people who ask for your vote are actually planning to do and, and why it's difficult to do the things that we sometimes need to do. Uh, and, and I believe in its purpose. So answer this question, why aren't we finding out what we need to know? It's because that moment that you captured so well, this, this, uh, this humanity, this, this story about people and what motivated them and what they cared about and what their character was and how they had to define that in the public spotlight, has really led us uh, you know, now to this place where uh, there's this tremendous fear and paralysis. Uh, it's, it's not entirely their fault. We have a very harsh media environment that unfolds in cycles by the second. Somebody has already started tweeting this event, probably Jack. Or something. And yeah, he's nodding at me. Uh, you know, and, and so you know, every, you know, this will all be public you know, so before I say it. And so uh, there's, there is this, this uh, paralysis about how to handle the media, how to handle the cycle, how to control the message. They want to control it. And what they've decided is that the best way to control it is not to engage. Uh, and you know, they tell themselves they can get the message out by other means. Uh, but I don't think it's very effective. They tell themselves they only need to talk to people who already agree with them, and I don't think it's true. Uh, but as a result, there it is harder to get to know people, put them in context, and explain what it is they want to do, because I don't think they want to be understood, and I don't think they want to be explained. Uh, I, I think they, they want to uh, travel from point A to point B in a very narrow, safe cocoon uh, as much as they can. And, and it is, uh, I will tell you, intensely frustrating when you want to make things understood and, and put them in context. It doesn't seem to me to be an honest bargain with the American people. I mean, how can you offer them this loaf of bread and not show it to them? Well, you, your first assumption is that there's a loaf of bread. <laughs> So, and I don't, I don't mean this, uh, I don't mean to be cynical about this. Uh, look, I think, I, think, uh, I think most people are in this for the right reasons. People who run for president, they want to do good for the country. And they you believe can't. They, they do, believe they can. You can't do otherwise. You can't, get, you can't go for as many years as it takes right. and get up every morning and stand at some freezing factory gate unless you believe it's got to be you. You, you, do, you have to believe it. But I think, uh, you know, look, I think we are at a very difficult moment. I think we're at a very difficult economic moment. I think we're at a very difficult moment in the arc of a, uh, of a country, of an empire, really, in the arc of an industrial power, right? There are arcs to, to, to powerful countries. Uh, and we are in a difficult moment in that arc. And I think the answers are difficult, and they, they displease people. The truth uh, can be unpalatable politically. So when I say there isn't necessarily a loaf, what I'm saying is the answers are too hard. 
They're too hard to sell and they're too hard to arrive at. Uh, and they're particularly hard in a two-party system where there are fewer and fewer real hardcore partisans, I think. Uh, you know, and, and more and more voters declaring themselves independent. Uh, and, and it's hard to get through primaries. And so I think, uh, I, I think they don't want to discuss and explain the issues because I think they lack the, either they lack the ideas necessary to address them or just as much they lack the confidence that they can make themselves understood. I mean, you also, how many people here saw Bill Clinton speak at the Democratic Convention or speak on TV? There was a politician, for better or worse, I don't care what you think about Bill Clinton, there was a politician who believed and has always believed that if he engages you in the argument and explains to you why he believes what he believes and why what he believes is better than the other guy, he's going to persuade you. He's going to win. There, now, I'll contrast that. I just did a cover. Some of you, I don't know how many readers we have here, but some of you may have seen I did a cover. Uh, Adam just referred to it on Ohio. And uh, I, did my, I started with a simple premise, as I always do, a very simple question with no answer predetermined, which is why is Ohio's economy getting so much better? Why are they a point below the national average? I went to Governor Kasich, and he took some time and spent some time with me. I went to Rob Portman, the senator there, who speaks for uh, you know, the Romney campaign in his, in his, in his uh, you know, sort of moonlight. I went to the White House, and I said, I would like the president, or the vice president if need be, to sit down and tell me, since he is a candidate for president of the United States, why his policies are responsible for an improving economy in the most important electoral state in the country. They dithered and they talked and they debated for weeks and they came back and they said, no, the president's not going to do it. So I tell you what, you make the president available for a half hour with the question of why his policies improved Ohio and I won't ask any questions. He can just tell me, no, he's not going to do that. Why in the world will the president of the United States running for re-election not take credit for good things happening on his watch? Because he doesn't believe that he can communicate, either he doesn't believe what he's saying about his policies or I think more to the point, doesn't believe that he can make himself understood and win the argument. And that is, that's a sea change in our politics, uh, and it's the hallmark of a campaign where very little is communicated or explained. I, 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 it's a, it's a d difficult ground for me to cover because one of the reasons that I've always loved pals is they want to show themselves to you. They figure if you know them, they got gotcha. you. And it's usually true. I mean, if you're dealing with guys who are good enough to get to the point where they could honestly become president, these right. guys are big suckers up of sunshine. I mean, they, they, are. they can turn a room around. Well, and the big advantage I've always had is, you know, they want to be understood at length, right? I mean, it's one thing, and the culture gets, the news cycle gets shorter and shorter, and your quotes get twisted out of context, and they get tweeted, and they get blogged, and, you know, look at what's happened to Romney in the last couple of days. with the territory. Really it it does, but, but my advantage was always, has always been, you know, going back three cycles now, that if you sit and talk to me, you, it's going to be lengthy, and your quotes are going to be represented in context. I mean, in 2004, and I interviewed John Kerry three times, a four-hour period on terrorism. There was a quote in that story, it was taken out of context, Republicans made an ad out of it, they beat him up in the last weeks of the campaign. There are some people in Washington who still blame me, you know, for partially defeating John Kerry. I always but, thought that. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, I wish I had such power. But, you know, they, they'd blame anybody but themselves. But the, but the fact is, you know, the quote was halfway down the story, it was not played up, it was in full context, it was clear for anybody who wanted the actual meaning. I mean, do I sympathize with, you know, being taken out of context? But uh, yes, but as you say, it comes with the territory, and my advantage has always been that I have this great length and this ability to really tell stories that, that, that politicians thought they, they, they could use that venue because they wanted to be understood, and the cost of not being understood in a venue that, that lengthy was too great. Uh, and, and I think they feel now that there's so much flood of information that they can get away with it, and there's too much risk in trying to make yourself understood. It also, you know, it also goes to the electoral strategy of both parties now. I mean, this, the other answer to your question, why aren't you getting more a sense of these guys is, and, and I do think, you know, for an incumbent president, we have, I think, strikingly little sense of who President Obama, Obama really is. is at the core, yeah. I would argue. And it, it's partly because there's this theory of the electorate now. It took hold during the Bush years. It was mimicked by moveon.org and the folks on the left, and it's now fully in play. And it goes like this. It says, there are, uh, there are no more undecided voters. How many people in this room consider themselves independent voters? You don't exist. Uh, because, because the polls all show, the polls all show 
that there are no unders, everybody's a Republican or a Democrat. There's nobody persuadable left. So all I need to do as a candidate is talk to, send mailings to my base, hold rallies with people who already agree with me, put up ads with code words that have been poll tested to get my people to the polls. And if I get more of my people to the polls than you get of your people to the polls, I'm gonna win. There is no point in having a debate about these issues because the public has already made up its mind. I think this is a very comforting thing to tell yourself because it means you don't have to go out and have an argument uh, and you don't have to or have an offend idea. your base, right? You don't have to offend the people who maybe voted for you in a primary by telling the rest of the electorate, the broad part of the, the middle of the electorate, what you might think is a reasonable solution. Hey, I, as president, you know, I actually did go out and try to get a grand bargain, and I was willing to cut a lot of money from Medicare and Medicaid. Like, I don't need to tell you that because I'm only speaking to the base of my party now. By the way, I, I think this theory is just, uh, you know, astonishingly wrong. And, Completely and, wrong. And one reason I think it's astonishingly wrong, you can get somebody to say in a poll whatever you want. First of all, the poll doesn't tell you how determined a voter you are. You can say you're going to vote for Romney, you can say you're going to vote for Obama. We don't know how changeable you are. But aside from that, how did Barack Obama ever win the presidency? He won independence by a wide margin. The last two Democratic nominees lost them. Who were those voters? Why did they change their minds? Why did George W. Bush lose like 20 points in his approval rate? Who were those voters? Hardcore Republicans who no longer agree with them? How did Barack Obama get a 4% convention bounce last week? Who were those people? Hardcore Democrats who didn't like him before and like him now? I, when someone can answer those questions for me, you know, some political, there's probably political scientists in the audience who's got a good answer, but it seems to me that, that uh, we sell voters short when we, when we paint them as automatons. I've spent 10 years traveling the country. I can tell you anecdotally, people want to make up their own minds, and they haven't made them up. Yeah, I agree with you. I don't think that, uh, I think that they have lost the thread of what a campaign really is. A campaign is a story. It's a story of this candidate and why this candidate's life brings them to the moment where it's got to be him or her, but we don't have any hers right now. <laughs> uh, what do you think would happen if you tried to do something like what it takes? Do you, do you think your book changed the, that dynamic or would it have changed anyway? Do you think it, do you think it contributed no. to a different attitude no, no, no. among politicians? No, I, I don't think it changed a damn thing. All the guys who come and say they love it and then they go out and they're tweeting <laughs> L little political news from, you know, the seventh district of New Jersey. But what I, what I do think uh, is that there were a lot of journalists who came after you who really wanted to do the same kind of fly on the wall, get inside the head, get inside the room, who weren't all that good at it and nah. weren't all that assiduous. No, nah. and something really changed. And I think it's this culture of operatives that, you know, there are two, or there are probably more than two, but, but let's, let's divide the, the great sea of candidates into the people who come because they got an idea and this has got to happen for the country and it's got to be me because I'm the one purveying this idea. And, and then there are people who just think it's got to be me because I'm me. I'm you know, be because I am the guy. Ideally, you've got both going on. Then you're in good shape. Right. Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and when push came to shove, he dropped the ideas. It was still about him. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, when it is a guy who is not driven by an idea, in fact, he'll take any idea that will make it him. Uh, Speaking of any candidates in particular? Uh, <laughs> quite a few, I'm, a, uh, I'm sorry to say. Anyway, when it's about it's got to be me, um, then there's no stricture because it's not about anything else except winning. And when it's not about anything else except winning, then it's an empty contract with the people because it, the, the idea of the whole thing, if, if, if I remember any political science, is that you uh, vote for me and this is what you're gonna get. The last honest yeah. transaction we had of that sort was Ronald Reagan. 
with whom I agreed well, with I, I, ab about almost nothing. But I, it's, it's interesting. Though. I, I disagree with that. I think, I think uh, you know, I've spent a lot of time going back over Bill Clinton's speeches in the late 1980s and early 1990s. There's a popular interpretation that Clintonism was, ex was political expedience. I will tell you how to get elected. And there was an element of that, no question. And Bill, Bill Clinton was saying to the public. Bill Clinton expedient? How could you say <laughs> such a I mean, Clinton was absolutely saying, saying to the Democratic Party, look, you're not getting elected if you can't get the South and the West. But, but there was a great intellectual backbone to his argument, of, uh, building on what Gary Hart had started talking about, which was really about the transformation of the American economy that I think, that I think was very real. Uh, and so I, I think Clinton did then and does continue to make an argument about modernity that was really important in the Democratic Party and started a real conversation. You know, you look at Romney today and you say, what is he, what is Mitt Romney, what is his big idea? What is he I, I, I'm going to, I would present you the most, they're having a terrible week, so it's easy to pile on. I'll present you the most sympathetic interpretation. Is I think, I don't, first of all, let me say, and I, I, I've told you this before, I, I don't know Mitt Romney. I, I mean, and I say that, you say, well, why? Why would you know Mitt Romney? I've known every presidential nominee now going back to 2000, in some measure, enough to t sit and talk to them for a few minutes. They won't let me within 10 feet of Mitt Romney. I mean, I, I, he, I, he could walk over me. I have no idea who I was. So I don't claim some great insight into his inner psyche. But I think, because I get to do that, right, conjecture, that at, at heart, what Mitt Romney thinks he's offering the American voter is a management consultant. That, it, that at base, he is a pragmatist who believes that he can solve any problem brought to him. George W. Bush felt a little bit this way too, although he's much more ideological. But I think, there's a, I think Romney, that is his core philosophy, is that problems can be solved by sound analysis and proficiency. And that if you, uh, you know, if, you're, if you hear all the facts and filter them through some basic worldview, you can make up your mind. So he doesn't really bring an idea. He brings a uh, skill set. A, a skill set. And I think it's very hard to communicate the skill set, particularly when your core skill set is being undermined by the fact that your campaign's a mess, <laughs> right? I'm a CEO. The same thing hi, hi, hi happened to Dukakis. Right, he was basic, I think, basically I think Romney offering is very a technocrat. Uh, and I think it's very hard to say. I'm a management consultant. I worked with this great company. I, you know, I turn things around, and I'll turn the American economy around. My campaign's a disaster. They're all fighting with each other. We don't know what our core message or our mission is. Are we a hedgehog? Are we a fox? Whatever that, you know, book as you know. What, what is, I have no, man, no management philosophy, but for my campaign, but you should let me run the country. I think that right now is undermining him more than whatever he said at this fundraiser or whatever he did on Libya. Forget the specifics. He has, his, his core overwhelm, overreaching argument to the public has to be that he's the guy you hire to turn things around and manage them. If he can't turn his own campaign around or manage it, that's a very hard argument to make. And all these stories about how mixed up they are, that to me is the most damaging thing. Hmm. Um. Why do you think we don't know any more about Obama than we knew mm. in 2008? That is, a, that is a complex question, Richard. I, you know, so let's start with this, right? Let's start with the premise that uh, President Obama ran for election in a, in a remarkable, anomalous American moment. So he doesn't run as a traditional Democrat. He really doesn't. If I were them, I don't know how they think about it, but if I were them, the first thing I would have done in this campaign is throw out the 2008 map because it's meaningless. 2008 was a completely strange moment. You had the Lehman meltdown. You had uh, this, the unpopular war, the unpopular president. I mean, I, I, he ran really more as an independent than he did as a Democrat. He ran as hope and change, which was whatever you wanted it to mean. If you were a pragmatic centrist, a non-ideologue, it was all about Clintonian pragmatism. If you were uh, a hardcore progressive, a Howard Dean supporter, he was the rebirth of the war on poverty. Whatever you thought hope and change represented, that's what he was. What he really was was a story. He was the embodiment of the American story we all badly want, need to believe, and have a right to believe, because it is the core of America. He represented that story, and that was a very hope and, and got elected with a very hopeful moment, and, and, a, and you, you all know the rest. Um, so one thing I don't think he's ever worked out as president is which is hope and which is change and where he falls, right? He's the president who sought a grand bargain, as I say, uh, you know, with the with the Republican Party by offering uh, a tremendous amount of budget cutting, a tremendous restructuring of entitlements that made his own party howl. Uh, and had he gotten it passed, would have probably, I believe, would have drawn him a, a third party challenge. Uh, but he's also the president who, you know, lambastes big business and want, talks, about, talks gleefully about raising taxes on the rich. You know, Bill Clinton has told people, it's fine to raise taxes, just don't seem like you're happy about it. Uh, Obama's <laughs> very happy about it. 
So, you know, wh which guy is Obama? I, 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 I know him a little bit. I don't know him well. I, I, would, I would posit to you that the president doesn't know the answer to that question because he never governed. And I don't say that as an indictment. I don't, you know, I, it's, I'm not doing the conservative thing of, you know, the guy has no experience. Experience is very different in the modern age. But when you are a governor or an executive of some kind, you are forced to work out your core philosophies. I remember Bill Clinton saying to me uh, when I interviewed him for my book, he said, he said, if I were Hillary, and I know you're going to think I'm just saying this because Hillary's run, you know, Hillary might run for president. He said, if I were Hillary, I'd go out right now, whether you're going to run for president or not, and I'd give a series of speeches on very complicated topics because I would not want to wake up on my first day in the White House and try to figure out what I believe. Now, I don't, he obviously wasn't, that's not an indictment he made of the president. This is prior to that campaign. But I think to some extent, this president woke up in the White House because of the circumstances of his election and asked himself what he believed. And I think he's been trying, we've watched him try to work out, you know, first it was, you know, it was Ron Mayer, then he brought in Bill Daly as chief of staff. That was a, you know, he was going to be a pro-business centrist driving can that that didn't work through daily out that sort of thing. I think I, I I think we don't know because they don't know and that doesn't mean he can't figure it out in another four years I'm not saying you know I, I it doesn't mean he's not brilliant or doesn't have convictions it just means that his core governing philosophy is a work in progress and so he doesn't want anybody to see that yeah, I think the problem is uh, four years past the presidency, he's still talking to two groups of voters with two different ideas about him. You know, liberals think one thing and, and independents and, and, and moderates, yes, they exist, think another. Uh, and so I think, you know, the problem for the president is that whenever he uh, wades into this, he, he tends to anger somebody who he needs. Um, and, and, you know, the, the, he's never been willing you know, and th this goes to the psyche of President Obama, because I think you also have to understand that he came in, he comes into politics, into public life, as, as the backlash against the Clinton era is really intensifying, the backlash against Clintonian centrism. He doesn't want to pick fights with his friends, because he considers that a Clintonian thing to do. There will be no sister soldier moment. Obama is a real thing about picking on your friends for political gain, which I think sometimes they confuse for be with being willing to have an argument over something right. you believe. Right. So, you know, you won't, he doesn't want to tell people things they, you know, in his own party they don't want to hear. Yeah, but I think that's too calculating. I think it's about who he is. You know, I, I, I'll tell you a story. When he was just about to get in, uh, I called up Joey Biden and I said, Joey, what's the chance of getting my face in there? Because I could have, you know, I could have paid off my mortgage. I could have, you know. <laughs> And, um, <laughs> and you know Joey tells the truth. So Do you really call him Joey? Yeah. <laughs> uh, he's okay with that. Oh, he's great. Yeah. So uh, he says, look, he says, it's never going to happen. And I can tell you exactly why it's never going to happen with two words, Barack Obama. This is before they got to be buddies. Uh, he said, I, my publisher went, came to me and said, look, we'll, can we do a deal where we make a box set of Obama's book and your book together, and we'll peddle some books that way? So Joey goes to Barack with the Clear who's getting the good with, end of that deal, by the way. With the deal, right? <laughs> And Barack says, not only are we not going to do that deal, but I want you to cut off all publicity for your book. I have cut off all publicity for my book. Uh, and I don't want you to do this profile that so-and-so is doing with you. And, you know, it's like they were screwing the hatches down on the submarine before they even got to the White House. This is just who he is. Yeah, uh, that, that, that's probably a lot of truth to that. You know, the problem with the people, you know, the people around him too is, you know, there's no 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 consultant in history, Senator Biden, would, I'm, I'm sure agree. There's never been a political consultant who won a campaign and turned around the next day and said to his boss, "We were lucky we won that campaign because it didn't have a thing to do with my strategy. That was, <laughs> that was just a great moment, right? I mean, I mean." Every consultant who wins a campaign thinks they're a genius. And what, you know, it's funny, but a series of policy choices
Governing choices flow from that assumption. Absolutely. If you won in 2008 and you told yourself it was because you built a mandate for an agenda, you didn't go back out and resell that agenda because you figured you'd already sold it. You thought people were really into having big government back because they'd elected all these Democrats. And from that flowed a series of policy choices that I think were very faithful. If you won election in 2008 and said, hmm, we didn't really say a lot that was specific. We got, a, we got really lucky and caught a big wave. People like me and they want to believe in me, but they've not, they don't know exactly what it is I'm going to do. Then a different set of choices was next. You think, well, I got 70% approval rating. I better go out while I have this approval rating and tell people what it is I intend to do over the next 18 months. And, and Reese, get it. Go out and sell it to the people, right? And, and, and get it and, done. And behave cautiously because, you know, and, and get to the economy first like a laser because that's what people are asking me to do. I think, I think you know, part of the problem with the, the heavy handedness you're describing is the absolute conviction that you won because you, because you were brilliant and because, you, because people agree with you. I don't think that's what the 2008 mandate, if you can call it a mandate, was really about. Right. I don't think it's an honest contract, but let's open it up to the people and see what they think. Uh, I'm going, to, if you will shout out your questions to me, I will repeat them. There's a lady in the back row or a gentleman, I can't see which, and, um, and I'll, I'll repeat them so the rest of the world can hear. Oh, that's very you're, good. You're doing fine. Did, did, did everybody over here hear this? Okay. The, the, the young lady, she's a senior here, and she worked in the Olympics in London this summer where Twitter was everything. And, uh, and in this election, Twitter is a very big force. Uh, and what she wants to know is, do we think it's a beneficial tool? Do we think it's a benign influence, or is it uh, in some way cheapening the discourse because everybody's down to 140 characters. I would personally these days go out and pay money for 140 honest characters. <laughs> uh, but uh, I don't think Twitter as a tool changes anything. I think it's just a continuation of the same chopping, you know, dicing of the, of information into tiny little, you know, pretty soon we're going to be down to those little bits that they give you to put on the salad bar, those <laughs> things bacon that, bits? soybeans that are really bacon, or, or the, you and I can start a political blog called bacon bits, it'll just be, Two words. Beautiful. Romney losing today. <laughs> <laughs> That's three. You're out. <laughs> uh, anyway, I, I think that the, that uh, Twitter is, uh, uh, as far as I know about it, I mean, asking me about Twitter is like asking me about rocket ships. But, uh, but it seems to me that it's primarily a tool for uh, generating uh, retweets and, and and likes in Facebook and and generally letting the base exercise itself uh, on some demon or some uh, great moment. It doesn't seem to me to be a discourse so much as a, well to coin a phrase, a retweet. You know, I, I think it's both. I, I do think it's both, because there, there's some pretty cool stuff. I mean, Twitter has some pretty cool capabilities. I'm thinking particularly of, uh, you know, the uprisings in, in Arab countries where, you know, information was being tweeted out and, and people then are able to organize around Twitter. I mean, it, it has this tremendous potential like the rest of the modern, rest of modern technology, and then it also has this potential to 
Well, it's very, down politics it's very good if you want people to know where your taco truck is, but it's not very good if you want them to know what you're no, going to do you about can, social uh, security. You know, it, it is for people, uh, there's, a, there's uh, state level news that gets broadcast on it through Twitter that you wouldn't otherwise see. Uh, there's there's, there's uh, constant links to stories, updates. Look, I, I but, but I, do, I, do I read it? No. I mean, do I, do I follow what's happening on Twitter? Do I think it's a, like an ennobling way to get your point across? I, I don't. But, but, you know, I've said this often. I, when people say, well, you know, the technology's changed politics, the, the Internet's changed politics, Twitter's changed politics, I, I just, it just hasn't. I don't the, agree. The Internet, I, Twitter, I, and everything, they've changed everything. They've changed the entire society. Politics is the last of American institutions to catch up to every cultural change. <laughs> uh, it's designed exactly that right. way. It's responsive. That's what politics is for. It's supposed to be responsive, not supposed to create trends. So, you know... The whole society is, uh, you know, uh, deluged is, is is digital. It's deluged information. It's about optimization, and it's it's uh, it's now you know niched into communities, uh, virtual communities, and you know politics is trying, I think, to adapt to that and just, find its way. Just in that, yeah, in that just arena. to keep its head above water. Most of the guys I know, I would like to. Can I prompt a question? I would like to hear from somebody who feels like. This, some, they have gotten something from this campaign. They, there's a reason why they're for who they're for. Anybody want to offer? Well, every single voter here is strongly decided. We've, we've already established that. Any hands? I, oh, yeah. Go ahead. Well, thank you very much, sir. Uh, I find this... listening to myself enormously depressing. As a... by, by the way, I agree with you. I, 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 think he's, I think he's accomplished a tremendous amount in this term. And, um, you know, I, I this gentleman wants, is supporting Obama because he believes he really has achieved good things and uh, will, in fact, achieve in a second term as well. But what I want to know is, did you learn about any of those things in this campaign? Right. It, the short answer is no. Why? Do you have any friends in the Obama campaign? Did you ever ask them why they don't go out and tell what the president has done? Isn't that interesting? He doesn't get an answer. Uh, who's a Romney uh, supporter who has actually learned something about Romney since Romney showed up in this campaign? <laughs> yes. Come on down and tell us about it. Just shout it out from that balcony like you're Il Duce. Did you get it? Did, could you hear that? Okay. Uh, how did you inform yourself?
are you out of work? Are you out of work? That's amazing. Whatever you're taking, I want some. <laughs> my, my will is good. My eyesight is good. I think you have poor. a question right, right in front and right in back. Okay. Sure. Which area of the safety net do you feel has been badly eroded? Yes, uh, the gentleman saying that he feels there's been an erosion of the social compact in America, beginning with the safety net for the least fortunate, which he feels has been badly uh, damaged. And my question, I just want to get a sense of which part of the safety net we're talking about. You know, I, I want to repeat I wanna, the question, man, uh, so they can all. You know, the, you know, we're talking about the criminal justice system and some of the programs being uh, cut back on, and you know, how do we sort of stop the uh, erosion of these programs and care for people who are less fortunate? Right? Is that a fair? I'm, you know, I, I mean, I'm gonna think out loud. I'm very tempted to answer this question honestly, and then I know Jack's gonna tweet, and I'm gonna get in all kinds of trouble. You're already in trouble. <laughs> Uh, so can I have a teaching job here at the college? When all this, um, we'll look, we'll I, take I, care of you. I, I will tell you what I what I, I, I'll tell you, you know what I think about this. Um, I am troubled by we we might have some disagreements over which you know whether government should be expanded or cut. But I am troubled by the fixation of politicians now, and I'm talking about in both parties. I know somebody's going to scream at me. There's a false equivalence, but we can take that issue separately. In both parties. Uh, on what we call discretionary spending. In other words, everybody wants to get tough on government. Everybody wants to, now everybody in both parties wants to cut government. Fine, good, I think there's a good argument for that. They can't really do it because all the costs, the real budget items, as we know, are in structural entitlements and national defense. But there's this little pot of money called discretionary spending, which is all the kinds of programs you're talking about. It's the thing that funds the agencies in Washington. And it's become very much in vogue for everybody to jump up and down and yell about discretionary programs, even though if you cut the entire discretionary, but you know, did, did do the Rick Perry thing and close, close three cabinet departments, whether you can remember them or not, you wouldn't even begin to address the long-term budget challenges that we have as a country. What troubles me about this is that what we're going to end up doing, what happens is rhetoric has a way of becoming reality, because then somebody holds you to it. And if both parties adopt the same rhetoric, my fear is, we're going to end up slashing the kinds of programs you're talking about. Some good, some not. I believe they should be subject to metrics and, and evaluation. But we're going to slash to the bone all this discretionary spending and wake up and find that we've done absolutely nothing about the structural budget problem in the country, but we've made a lot of people feel good. Because um, that's not where the money is. Now, the reason I don't want to answer that question honestly, and I already have, is that where the money is gets people really riled up, right? which is in these entitlement programs. Now, we can argue about whether these entitlement programs are structurally sound. You can argue about whether they can be kept solvent, whether Medicaid and Medicare, Social Security, as they're constructed, uh, are programs that we should, that, that we can fix. Because, you know, Paul Krugman will say, well, you can tweak Social Security and you raise this tax and you raise this cap and you're good. You're good to go. And, and, and that's true. But what, the conversation we don't have in this country is over how much of your income as a country you want to invest in your elderly citizens. How much can we afford to invest of our national product in people in their final years of life rather than people in, who are of prime earning age, having children, requiring education, and requiring infrastructure? Because what you'll end up doing by making everything solvent and workable is transferring a huge amount of national wealth to your retirees. Now, that's a debate worth having. 
Because there are probably a lot of people who would say, that's great, that's what we should do, they've earned it. Let's transfer that, let's, let's invest in our retirees. But an honest conversation about how you fix, how you fix debt and budget problems, and how as a nation you want to invest, and in whom, is what this campaign should largely be about. That's what I want to hear. And I want to hear why do they feel I'll that now way. be your research assistant. That's what I want to hear. That's exactly what we should be talking about, is what well, kind of country we want to Let me moderate a debate. We'll be. get to it quickly. Uh, <laughs> that's a very good question. That's a very good question. I, um, and you had one in back, too. Uh, yeah, we want to get to one, one right back. Well, let me say a couple of quick things. A, a couple did, of quick things. Did, Richard did, may have some, did you all some hear thoughts, that? too. Did you all hear the question? Okay. Yeah. I mean, look, first of all, we don't control the debates. That's a myth. The, those debates are controlled by the Presidential Debate Commission, which is controlled by the two parties and corporate sponsors. I, I think the Presidential Debate Commission should be abolished. I will hold the debate where I want to hold the debate. If you don't want to show up, you don't get to be heard. But I, I really don't like the idea that we allow the two parties to determine how the debates will be held, and what the format will be, and who will moderate them. Because to me, it's our show, not theirs. So exactly. That's, that's the first thing. We, we want to be served. Yeah, I, I just don't think, I've never understood this. Like, I, how about we go hold the debate and you can show up or not? Just like we should hold the campaign and you can come or not. Why are we following you around on a point? Anyway, <laughs> right, so that's what, the second, but the, but the larger point, uh, aside from the debate, is w we can't talk about media in this country anymore. Right, we can't talk about the media. It's not informative. Because I don't do what a blogger does. I don't do what the New York Post does, right? They don't do, you know, Entertainment Tonight isn't me, and, and, and neither, you know, Foreign Affairs is doing something different. We, we have a- I've always thought of you and Wolf Blitzer, more <laughs> or less. Now I'm gonna start shouting. You know, we have, we have a, um, you know, we have this wide array of media, and, and, and it's incumbent really upon consumers of media to be really sophisticated about it. Like, like that fabulous Romney guy up there. He's a sophisticated yeah. Unbelievable consumer. consumer. Because, because look, what they're doing, I mean, you're telling me there's a lot of one-on-one -on -one interviews. Yes, there's one-on-one -on -one interviews. The president went on The View, and he's doing entertainment tonight. He's doing local network anchors. Look, I have nothing against local network anchors. I'm glad there's still local news, and it's not all about shooting. But, but they're not, they, they're doing that for a reason. They're going on entertainment tonight for a reason. They're going on local news. They're going to Dayton Daily News instead of talking to me about Ohio for a reason. They get easy questions. Their people are awestruck. The interview lasts for 10 minutes. The people aren't averse. They don't cover the issues day to day. Like, they're being very sophisticated about the, how they manipulate use of media. And we need to be equally sophisticated about how we consume and view media. Because I would argue that they may be going out and doing interviews and talking but they're not explaining anything. Yeah, they're not the, sitting with me. As that fella said uh, up there, he said, I want the journalist to come back and say, answer the question. Yeah, well, the yeah. first thing is you have to have an actual journalist in the room. <laughs> you know, entertainment tonight is not gonna hold his feet to the fire. Uh, that's exactly right. Who else wants to mouth up like us? Uh, did you all hear that in the back? Uh, the gentleman said, 
uh, he referred to my comment of why don't we know these voters, what my question about why don't we know these voters, and he said, does this indicate their attitude toward the American voter? Is this their Marie Antoinette moment where they're saying, let the voters eat cake? Uh, I think that the, uh, one of the questioners up there had a good insight when he said that the candidate will take the path of least resistance, or what he's been told is the path of least resistance, because actually he doesn't know. And uh, this is how they told him he can win. And he, he has put his life, literally his life, and his family's life, on the line for this roll of the dice where 11 out of 12 of them are going to be on the bottom of the birdcage. They're dead. They're, it's finished. So he wants to win. <laughs> and they told him, look, this is the only way you can win because if we let you just go out there and say what you want to say to the voters, it's over. You're toast. And he's scared to death because he's never done this before it, at this moment. And he's paying these people a fabulous amount of money. And there's a lot of them. And they have meetings and they have suits. And they all get around him and tell him what the message is today. And that's the message. And if he says anything other than the message, he knows he's going to hear about it. And he, nobody has told him anything honest for the last two years because <laughs> they can't get near him. He doesn't see his old friends anymore. He doesn't even see his family anymore. They're on another plane. Uh, what he's got are these guys in suits telling him unless he does this or that, he's dead. After a while, it begins to play on your mood. Yeah, the, the question is, you know, don't we, isn't the real problem we have a contrarian culture in Congress where uh, people won't work together to fix any problems, uh, to solve anything? Yeah, yeah, we do. We, we, have a, we have a real problem with this. Um, I was very surprised, you know, that, that Governor Romney chose Paul Ryan as a running mate. Uh, not because of Paul Ryan, not because of the plan, the, you know, the Medi Medicare and all that. I mean, I, I, I know Ryan a little bit, and he's, he's a very bright, personable guy. Because why would you saddle yourself with the lowest approval rating that any Congress has basically ever received since they started taking the polls? The Republican Congress, Republican-led House of Representatives has an approval rating like lower than you or me if they went out and did, you know, <laughs> and, you know, you know lower than mold. And yet, somehow, you know, you want to bring that into your outsider. I mean, the, the only people who get elected president in America are people who present themselves as bona fide outsiders. But somehow you want to saddle yourself with the Republican Congress. Very strange. But, you know, uh, most of the most of the you know the blame. I mean, people tend to blame Congress for that dysfunction, and I think fairly. I think Congress is a mess, uh, and uh, and I think this this Republican-led uh, Congress has been really obstinate, uh, and, and I think and I think cynical in dealing with a lot of issues. But you know, I would say this too. You know, I had an interesting conversation with a governor, a former a former governor. I, I can't remember if it was on the record or not, so I'm not going to name him, but. He'd done a lot of really bipartisan stuff in his state, and, and when the president was struggling with Congress and they'd shut down on, over this grand bargain stuff, he said to me, you know, I went out and I tried to uh, deal with the other party in my state, and they slapped me down and they made a fool of me. I invited them over to the mansion for beer. They came over for beer. They went out. We did another date. They went out and made a fool of me. I went back again and again and again, and I passed comprehensive tax reform in my state. And his point to me was, it is naive to think that you reach across, once you have a bunch of people to a Super Bowl party or a meeting or whatever it is, or you have a discussion on issue and you get slapped, you know, knifed in the back, and you walk away. And I think what happened in this presidency 
with the Congress to some extent, is that they thought that the best way to succeed with Congress was going to be to staff their White House with all these congressional aides. They built the most congressionally focused administration in history, at least in modern history. Jack will probably tell me there was some 18, something, but in, in, in modern history. And, um, and the problem was that what they imported, along with all that expertise about the congressional process, is they imported all this toxicity, all this partisan fury, all that anger from the Bush years of getting kicked around the hill all day. That's what all these aides had experienced. They came, they came in, they started working in the White House. And the minute the president reached out on the stimulus, and the minute he got slapped around by the Republican House, he was embarrassed. He went to the hill to meet with them, remember? He thought he was going to get a hearing. They'd already decided to oppose him. The minute he was embarrassed, the first time, all these guys turned around and said, Mr. President, we told you, you can't do, you cannot work with these people. They're savages. They're crazy. They can't be reasoned with. You can't, we've done this for 10 years. Trust us. They're bad people. You can't work with them. And he bought it. And the only way as a president I think you get out of that box, even when they're at fault, and I think they are largely at fault, the only way you get out of that box is to go back and back and back. That's how you build relationships with the world. It's frustrating. It's painful. I'm not sure I'd have the character to do it, but I think that's what's required. And I think it's the sporadic nature of their outreach, I think, puts some of the culpability for that on the White House. Absolutely. The question is, do, do I feel, does Matt feel that the campaign advisors, the operatives who surround the candidate or the president, are putting so much pressure on them to stay on message and, you know, say only this or do only that, that, uh, how did you end it? That, less, it, that it becomes less about the issues than about just the strategy or the tactical advantage that day. And there's no question that that's a, that happens all the time. But it's not just that the issues get lost. It's that the guy in the middle of them gets lost. We can't even see him. And this, to me, is a dishonest commerce. You know, uh, I was going to say before that I... Uh, the last honest one that I saw was Reagan, who I didn't agree with about anything, but he said what he wanted to do. He got in there, that's what he tried to do. <laughs> and I thought it was an honest bargain with the American people. They voted for him, okay, you know? Mm -hmm. And he's the last one who's gone down as a good president, too, in the popular belief system. Well, you know, I mean, Clinton's approval rating's high, but I, I agree with you for all, with all the obvious caveats. Well, we love Clinton, but, but I'd rather have him on a soap. But let me, but let, you'd rather what? Have him on a soap. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> but let, me, let me just say this, because it, it goes to the nature of your question and, and a bunch of other questions. I don't want to leave the wrong impression about this. This is not all about politicians being Craven. Uh, Richard and I were talking about this before, and it's worth sharing. I'll, I'll share with you. You know, I, I've gotten to know over the years, I've come in contact with many, many people who cooperated with your book. Uh, and as I told you, and, and I've never heard a person say that that was wrong. It was inaccurate. Everybody felt well treated. Everybody feels that book was accurate. It's one of the reasons it's endured as long as it has. It's because you did the hard work. You'd been an actual reporter. You'd been a very successful reporter. You did the hard work of sourcing and double sourcing, and you thought about what it was like to be in the shoes of your character. There was some empathy, and you didn't, you didn't set out to harm them or screw them in some way. You know, too much of the modern media culture is about what gets you on TV or what gets you pick up on Twitter. And, and look, it, it's very, I'm, I'm full of sympathy for other people, but it, it's very hard. It's easy for me to say. I work at the New York Times Magazine. It's very hard for a new journalist at a lesser known site to get noticed. It's very hard to break out. When you get that big quote, you gotta use it. And yeah, of course they go on MSNBC all day long. It's easy for me to say they don't have to do it because I have readers, you know, and, and that's, that's, there is a, a need to promote yourself. So I, I get that I speak from this like, you know, Olympian height about this. But the, the fact is, 
you know, it's a very frightening, unfair media environment. I mean, people aren't careful, they aren't sympathetic, they aren't fair, they aren't contextual, and they will kill you if you say something stupid. Um, and unless, you know, there are certain politicians like a Joe Biden who are so verbose and are so known as part of their brand that they just say something kind of crazy every now and then that they can kind of weather that. But a lot of people will lose their careers over it. Um, and so I sympathize with the caution. I sympathize with the cynicism. I don't think the right response, it goes to your question, I don't think the right response is to withdraw because I think you owe something better to the voter. And I think there is a contempt in the voter that's inherent in saying, I'm not going to explain myself because I can't trust that I'm going to, you know, I'm not going to wake up tomorrow and be miscast. But we have a responsibility that we fail in all too often to put things in context so that people aren't punished for being fair and, and for trying to express Or themselves. for trying to actually express an my idea. Rule, you know, my rule, and I tell sources this all the time in politics, because you know, people have heard my shtick a million times who work now, I'd say, you know, it, I have a responsibility, I got a lot of readers, and I have a responsibility to bring them the best explanation and access that I can. And if you refuse to cooperate, I consider it a personal affront to those readers, and I will kick you around in print for you. But if you give me access, if you spend time with me, that counts for something. I'm not going to take the one stupid thing you say and twist it around and, and make you look like an idiot and make that. I'm not going to go on TV. I don't go on TV and say, you know, and talk about the big quote. When John Kerry was attacked in 2004 by Republicans, I didn't go on any TV. I shut down. I went into my office or my house. I closed the doors, and I didn't answer the phone, and I didn't come out. Because I'm not looking to make my name off of you. But you've got to be, you have a contract with our readers, and I have a contract with you. And uh, I think that's a fair way to do what I do. And I, I think, think that's is, basically that's how you work about fair way. your book as well. Uh, folks, uh, I don't want to keep you here all night, so we're, we're going to wrap it up. But uh, I don't want to leave you with the, uh, uh, entirely dispirited about this thing. <laughs> because I think that somewhere lurking in the candidate pool, uh, if not for this year, then uh, for future years, are the same uh, grabbers of sunshine and glad handers and people who do want to show themselves. This will come around. We just happen to be, as Matt said at the beginning, at a very special and difficult moment. And I hope that the 2012 election turns out to be a good thing for you. <laughs> whatever your political <laughs> persuasion. Uh, and I thank you very much for coming tonight. Thank you. Thank you thanks. Thanks to all of you for coming, and thanks especially to uh, Richard and, and Matt. Matt, we know how much you've got on your plate right now, and perhaps Chestertown is not the epicenter of political reporting, so we appreciate your taking the time. Glad now, uh, Matt and Richard will be available signing some <coughs> books in the lobby. We also hope that you'll join us for the next in this series. We'll be hearing from Sasha Isenberg, who's the young author of a new book called The Victory Lab, which is about the technology of winning elections. It'll be very different, and I think a provocative new take on the presidential election. We'll hope to see you then. That's at Hinton Lounge. And it's at Hinton Lounge.